boss fights by their very nature tend to be a bit on the longer side of things. This is justified since they're meant to be more challenging and impactful than a regular battle. Then there are these bosses, the kind where you figure out the strategy early on, but they still take forever to die. The kind where you're constantly thinking, WHY CAN'T YOU JUST DIE? Whether it's due to inflated health, an abundance of different forms, or few opportunities to inflict damage, these are the bosses that go on pretty much forever. The criteria is simple. The longer the boss, the higher it places. With that said, there are a lot of rules we have to lay out first. One, multiple phases and forms absolutely count. Two, no bosses that are fought at the end of a boss rush or a gauntlet of bosses. They have to be long on their own. Three, if the boss includes unskippable cutscenes and especially long attack animations, then that will be counted as part of the length. Four, these bosses have to be long even when using the optimal strategy. If there's a common or easily executable strategy that lets you trivialize them, then they're off the list. Five, if the game has difficulty settings or there's an unlockable stronger version of a boss, that will be a factor. Six, genre context matters. For example, if a boss from an action game and a boss from an RPG are both 10 minutes long, action games generally tend to have shorter boss fights compared to RPG games because of pacing. Seven, Secret methods of defeating a boss like Phoenix Downs on undead enemies will be disregarded since they're more like Easter eggs than anything else. 8. Glitches and exploits are also disregarded since they're not what the devs intended. And since we're talking about long bosses, I decided to go one step further and make this a top 15. Hang in tight folks, we're in for the long one. <laughs>《ロスト・オデッセイ》A lost gem among the obscure JRPGs that run amok. A lost journey directed by the creator of Final Fantasy himself, Hironobu Sakaguchi. And lost as it is only available on Xbox when most JRPG players tend to lean more towards PlayStation and Nintendo products. Lost Odyssey indeed. Anyways, for those who haven't played or heard of this game, it's a turn-based JRPG for the Xbox 360 developed by Mistwalker. It follows Kaim and his group of fellow adventurers as they try to stop the plot of the evil sorcerer Gungaga from his ultimate plan and learn more about their past along the way. Honestly though, for this entry, you don't need to know any of that because we're not talking about the story whatsoever. We're talking about the super boss of this long game, the Immortal One. The Immortal One is a fitting name, as this guy takes absolutely forever to take down. With 175,000 HP in a game where it's hard to hit 9,999, and in a game where spellcast animations take forever, and regular attack animations require you to line up a ring to do extra damage, it'll take a while. He's immune to black magic, so you'll need to rely on physical attacks, white and spirit magic too. As for his attacks, his entire arsenal is designed to keep your resources at a minimum. His cube attack can reduce you to 1-2% to of your health, his sneeze attack will reduce your shields, and he also has the spell Divide which will do damage to you equal to the amount of health he has left. And did I mention he has 175,000 HP? Yeah. You're gonna need a bigger boat. So how do you beat him? Use Divide yourself. Make sure your HP is maxed out on 9,999 and spam Divide. Just make sure you also cast faster on yourself too as the casting for Divide takes two turns and this battle is long enough. If he hits you with Cube, use Reverso, which will do damage based on how much HP you're missing. Skills like Complete Defense or Crisis Defense will assist greatly in your survivability. Don't use full heals either or else, guess what? He'll Cube ya. Gotta withstand the Cube. Even at level 99, this fight can take upwards of 20 minutes to beat, and as far as I can tell, the Divide Strat is the fastest way to put him down. True, he is the game's super boss, so him taking a while shouldn't be surprising, but that's why he's here. If you aren't prepped, the Immortal One will trounce you, and even your own Immortals won't be enough to save you. That's, um, a uh, story reference. No spoilers. But, I'm not telling you the context, go play the game yourself! Ace Attorney Investigations is a little different from your average Phoenix Wright Fair. Instead of courtroom battles, you investigate crime scenes as Miles Edgeworth and question witnesses on the spot. There's no rules and set for how long you're allowed to question someone, meaning it's possible for a single session to last a long while. 
Which brings us to Turnabout Ablaze, one of the longest cases in Ace Attorney history. In Edgeworth's quest to topple an international smuggling ring, he investigates the Kadopian Embassy led by two ambassadors of the formerly United Nation. One of these ambassadors is Callias Paleno, a welcoming, slightly nervous fellow who's set on reuniting the nation back together. He seems suspicious, but he didn't really have much to hide and is really honest with his line of work. As for the other ambassador... Smells like millennials over here. Reminds me of the time I went to Coachella. Quercus Alba was formerly the ambassador of Kodopia, now governing only his side of the nation after it's been split. He seems like a humble old man at first, deprecating himself for how weak and old he's gotten, and fairly strict over the safety of his territory. But of course, we just ruled out Palaino from the suspects list, so I think you all know where this is going. Yep, this guy's the big bad we've been looking for. As it appears, Alba's been controlling the smuggling scene from the back, all the while personally eliminating the people who plan to usurp him, including Damask II, who tried to steal the counterfeit he kept in his office, and Manny Cochin, his secretary and fellow smuggler whom he fought near the Embassy Theater. The former's murder he even confessed to willingly, claiming it was self-defense. However, even with evidence pointing to him as a first-degree murderer and a smuggling ringleader, Taking him down is no easy task. Why? Extraterritorial rights. I've got diplomatic immunity, so hey mate, you can't sue. Tree Man will worm his way out of any argument simply because the crimes are his country's business, not the local courts. And as an ambassador, he has the right to say no whenever he pleases. Even if you clarify that the crime is outside of the foreign soil, he won't let up, coming up with some of the most absurd counterproofs and getting away with it. Just because you're a diplomat, you can park anywhere you want? Most big bads in the series usually take at most two episodes per case to go down. Interrogating this guy takes up three episodes. So as you can tell, it takes a lot of work to put him out of commission, especially since every argument can be summed up as such. This evidence proves that you were in the dressing room killing the victim with a weapon that has your prints on it. Witnesses even claimed you went to the dressing room at the exact time the victim died. Hmm, nice deduction. But you see, I went to the room to brush my teeth with a Mizwak. But the room the victim died in only has regular toothbrushes. So I'm sorry, but it's not the same room. No! He has a point. As ridiculous as this verbal clash may be, it does put into perspective the legal principles surrounding beyond a shadow of a doubt. Prosecutors are entitled to their duty to prove that the accused is guilty without a stone left to be turned. With how our legal system is set up, we would pretty much rather let a hundred criminals go free than send an innocent man to prison. Ace Attorney has a habit of putting the accuser in a holy shade, but this is an instance where we get to see what prosecutors are really meant to deal with. Makes you appreciate Wright's company all the more, don't you, Miles? I liked the Pokemon GameCube games before Trigger Conroy made it cool. <clears throat> you notice that the Pokemon GameCube games tend to be harder than the main series? I guess because they were going for a more mature audience with them. While Colosseum was fuming in places in terms of difficulty, XD had a more balanced pacing to it. At least, for the most part. Because no matter how much love I or others have for the Pokemon GameCube games, and XD in particular, can disguise the fact that XD's final boss is sheer BS. Grievel is the current leader of Cypher and the one pulling the good guy with squinty eyes persona, but actually it was me, Evil Eyes McGee, with all my evil. Good gracious, that trope was dumb, but not as dumb as this fight. First off, you need to take on the Shadow Lugia that greville has been controlling all game. You might as well use your Master Ball on this guy because you will need the stamina and patience to handle Greevil's actual team. Remember how everyone in Coliseum only had one Shadow Pokemon on their teams? And remember how XD said, screw that, we're gonna have multiple? Well, Greevil's entire team is just Shadow Pokemon. Oh, and these aren't easy to catch Pokemon either. Zapdos, Articuno, Moltres, Rhydon, Tauros, and Executor. Three legendaries and three rare Pokemon makes this fight stupid hard. And of course, since this is XD, you need to catch all six Pokemon to fully win, which will take a while. Now the chucklers in the back are screaming out with a bit of an echo. Well, you can just faint all of them. That won't take that long. And that's true but we're looking at the correct way to fight these bosses. And in Grievel's case, it's to catch all of his Pokemon. Sure, you can catch some of them and fate the rest so you can come back later, 
but that's technically still fighting him as a boss, and therefore, increasing the time that you're fighting him. And even if you go for the faint strat, Grievel's shadow Pokemon hit hard and have annoying attacks like Shadow Storm, Shadow Sky, Shadow Down, and each of the birds have their own unique shadow moves that do a bunch of damage to you. So good luck surviving if you can. Oh yeah, and this fight is at the end of one of the longest and hardest final dungeons in Pokemon history with Citadark Isle, where the difficulty ramps up and tests you in ways that none of the other Pokemon games have and since. Eh, with a few exceptions. Sure, Grievel has alternate strats to beat him, and honestly, you could get lucky with catching his Pokemon to make the overall fight much shorter. But when playing normally, you can't sit there and tell me that this battle doesn't take an absolute eternity when doing it correctly. Plus, if you aren't catching all of the Pokemon in the game, what kind of trainer are you? You know, I'm starting to see why they call this Pokemon XD. It's like they're laughing at us. This next boss is the one that made me realize that we needed an action game distinction for the list. Bayonetta, the action game with the protagonist who uses hair as a weapon, and no other characteristics I can think of. It isn't that surprising to see a Bayonetta boss on these lists. Honestly, it's more surprising that you don't see these bosses here more often. Well, let's get to it, because you guys know that we're talking about Jubileus, and this boss has a lot to it. That's why it's here, after all. So you put young Cereza to bed after beating Daddy Balder into the ground, and the credits start to roll. Unfortunately, this game was made by Platinum Games, so the credits are halted in the middle, and Bayo is grabbed by the game's main villain, Jubileus, in a hope to steal her abilities. Jean, finally free from mind control, drives up the side of a rocket, heading to space to save her. So this section takes forever in itself as you need to defeat a bunch of enemies with John to reach Jubileus and free Bayonetta. Eventually, you reach the head of the statue and free her and start the actual crutch of the battle. The core fight itself has five phases to it that you need to work through. If you see my final boss's countdown, you know the gist of this fight. Jubileus will attack with her hair and you need to destroy the different parts of it to break down their HP. Throughout the fight, she will change the arena around with different elemental factors to make it more difficult to reach her. Starting with fire, then ice, the wind, and ending with, well, not really a new element, but she starts going full force. The final phase of hers is the most difficult as her hair pieces can shock you now and she can summon insta-kill portals to make you start this long fight all over again. Finally, you reach the climax to summon the Queen of Inferno and launch Jubileus into the sun, finishing her off once and for all. Finally, the credits roll again, showing your triumphant victory, and yeah, nope, she's still not dead! Her spirit merged with the sun, and she's gonna collide with the earth unless you kill her in the next minute or so. So you do, and then the game's over. Seriously, son, no take backs, nothing. She's done and gone. Balder isn't, but that's for Bayonetta 2, and maybe 3, but that isn't out yet. The fight against Jubileus could take up to 20 minutes depending on your skill level and difficulty. For an action game, that's insane as these fights tend to not last as long. Like, really look at a lot of boss battle lengths in games like Kingdom Hearts or God of War. They feel like they take longer, but they actually don't. Honestly, the longest and most cinematic part is the rocket ride with John, and that does count technically since it's on the same mission. But I digress, Jubileus is lower because with enough skill you can easily beat the main fight much quicker than most bosses and cutscenes do play a large factor. At least the fight is super fun too, which makes the effort way more satisfying. As a spiritual successor for the Left 4 Dead series, Back 4 Blood throws its hat into the undead pandemic ring by having the game set in a post-apocalyptic world where a parasite turns humanity into mutants known as the Ridden. Only a small group of survivors, the Cleaners, stand between the Ridden and their home in Fort Hope. Unfortunately for the Cleaners, the game's final act comes with one last big obstacle. It's Godzilla! Oh boy, now we're gonna need a bigger boat. Meet the appropriately named Abomination, an enormous titan of a Ridden aiming to crush Fort Hope in its unsavory rampage. To wrap the game up and save your homestead, you're gonna have to pursue this mutated beauty in three stages, as well as take out any Ridden that comes your way. No pressure or anything! In phase one, you have to take out its four tentacles that spring out of the ground, and each tentacle destroyed brings out more grunts to slow you down. Phase two has you dodging acid attacks while trying to take out the wheat spots in the Abomination's mouth while still dodging Ridden attacks. Feeling overwhelmed yet? 
Oh, just wait. In the final phase, you have to chase it down, take out the four weak spots all over its body, and say it with me now, still avoiding ridden grunts all within five minutes. Or else our grizzly leviathan will reach for it hope, and the last of humanity is pretty much doomed. C for effort? In concept, it seems like a pretty straightforward fight. Look for the weak spots, use the right tools, I recommend grenades for the tentacles and the mouse stages, and keep on the Leviathan's trail. But the stages gradually grow in difficulty and force you to juggle your main targets and all the annoying ridden running around to take a bite out of you. So yeah, you're in for a hard, long run. Not surprised considering how broken the game actually is. Seriously, if this is the game on easy, I don't want to know what hard is like. There's a clip from a Budokai game in every single countdown that I make, and yet I barely ever talk about it. Let's fix that! Man, the Budokai games are awesome. They were the pinnacle of Dragon Ball fighting games for a good while, at least until Fighter Z came around. Having all of the major Dragon Ball characters duke it out in a tight controlled fighting game is a really fun experience, even more so with all the fan service poured into each of the games. Kakarot? Huh? My name's Goku. Out of the three Budokai games, two is the one people talk about the least. I wouldn't say it's worse than the other two games, but it's considered the forgotten middle child, literally being both the middle game and the only one to not be remastered when the Budokai collection came out. I think one of the reasons for its issues is its weird Mario Party-esque story mode Dragon World. In Dragon World, you play as Goku and a few other Dragon Ball favorites in a game board setting and take turns moving to take on the villains that rule over each board. And as you can expect in this type of scenario, each battle takes forever. And what Dragon Ball game would this be if the longest and most difficult fight wasn't Majin Buu? A game that ignores Super, GT, and Heroes, but I digress. Kid Buu is the final opponent in both Dragon Ball Z proper and in Budokai 2's final stage. Now at this point, if you've been diligent in unlocking characters, you have a nice small army to handle Kid Buu. Here's the problem, Kid Buu also has a small army with most of the previous enemies that the game threw at you. Combine that with a big map and Buu being stuck on the other side, this is gonna take a while. Now this alone can make it a candidate for this list as this is a fighting game. Any fight that takes longer than five minutes could qualify. And some people can argue that the board itself shouldn't count to the battle. Well, even when you get to Boo, you need to beat him at least three times before he's considered defeated. You lose to him, your character gets knocked back and loses health. He gets beat, he recoils, and you need to chase after him. So either way, to fully beat the gumball, you need to use the board to your advantage. And reminder, this is a fighting game, where sometimes the bosses are cheating or psychic. It isn't really that surprising that Boo of all Dragon Ball villains is on this list. His arc is the largest in the whole franchise. This is the final stage of the game, unless you have the weird Nekomajin board in your game. So it's expected for this fight to take both time and skill to beat. But hey, it's a Dragon Ball fighting game. You were expecting this going in, weren't you? In a cosmic sort of way, I guess you could give this points for anime accuracy. I mean, think about how long Dragon Ball villains take to defeat. I think it's no surprise by now that Kirby Final Bosses tend to take the tone of the game a step upwards from the usual. Some of these fights did prove to be a test of strength and endurance, on top of being a marvel to the eyes and ears. One of the more well-known Final Bosses in the series is Dark Mind, a demon sealed within the mirror world who sought to corrupt Dreamland with his evil. Now, it's to be expected that a Kirby Final Boss would take a while to beat, but would you believe me when I say that this guy set a record even beyond that? Dark Mind starts up rather simple. You deflect his attacks and try to cut through his shields either with your abilities or with the Master Sword Galaxia. He went down pretty fast at first, but then you find him a second time. And a third time. And for the- okay, how long before we get to the actual challenging part? Fortunately, the form that comes afterwards is a little different. Dark Mind reveals his true self and goes on an all-out offense, swinging his mirror, summoning minions, shooting lasers, and true to his mirror motif, flips the screen vertically to mess with you. Now this is the epic climax we're talking about! If you can bear how long it takes to even damage this guy. Dark Mind's weak spot, his eye, takes only a fraction of a damage from your attacks at a time. So you're not gonna get many opportunities to combo him, leading to the boss himself being a real stubborn damage sponge. If you're not prepared to put your A game to the test, you're gonna be spending a lot of time trying to whittle this guy's health bit by bit. Nonetheless, after giving it your all to beat him, does he finally go down? No! Even after 
five phases worth of beatdown, Dark Mind is still not dead. Instead, you gotta chase what's left of him across the sky in a shoot him up segment. I mean, yeah, this is cool, but come on! Okay, so you shot him down. His health is down, so that should be it, right? Nope! You still fight this guy even as the credits are playing because holy cow, is this red hot marble too stubborn to die? At this point, I'm convinced Hal knew how long the fight took and was just screwing with us. Well, admittedly, there is something kind of funny about developers just deciding to make this one final boss so ridiculously long compared to other final bosses in the series. It adds a uh, personality, weird as it may sound. Kudos to you, Dark Mind. You'll be treasured as the most tenacious jack Yay. Streamland will ever know. There's a lot to be said about the roguelike genre. Every one is unique with almost infinite possibilities. One of the flagships of this genre, one of the most enduring entries, is The Binding of Isaac. Coming from the man who created one of the hardest platformers ever, The Binding of Isaac hates you. The game will lie, cheat, and steal to end your runs. Every dirty trick in the book, Isaac will employ to screw you over. Generating rooms with hazards that are one tile in front of the door, enemies that spawn directly on top of you, and getting cheated out of earned rewards are just a few ways in which Isaac will try to both ruin your run and your day. Of course, that's part of the fun of Binding of Isaac. Those once in a blue moon occasions where you get a run powerful enough to kick the game back, few things feel as satisfying. But in the bowels of the game, there's a boss that lurks. A boss that sees your uber-powerful run and laughs. Hush. What makes Hush able to scoff in the face of even your most powerful runs? Two words. Super armor. Fighting game vets will be familiar with this term, something that protects from flinching when taking damage. In The Binding of Isaac, this term has an altogether different meaning. Hush will take less damage based on the player's damage stat. The actual calculations behind how super armor in Isaac is applied is a bit convoluted, but long story short, the game takes into account your damage stat and how much damage you've done to Hush in the last four seconds and gives him super armor accordingly. As mentioned earlier, bosses on this list are partly ranked on how long they are for their genre slash game. In Isaac, even with a mediocre run, most bosses only take four or five minutes. Hush, on the other hand, can take upwards of 30 minutes even on more powerful runs. However, because of the genre, we also kind of ignore rule four for Hush. Kinda. As Binding of Isaac is a roguelike, calling find a chaos card to throw it at Hush to one-shot him an optimal strategy where you can go hundreds of runs between finding one of those chaos cards is a bit of a stretch. There are certain item combinations that can chew up Hush, but again, finding those exact combinations is a roll of a very, very large and many-sided dice. And the funny thing is, Hush is a timed encounter. If you don't get far enough in the rung by 30 minutes, you can't fight him. Strange how the longest fight in the game requires you to zoom through most of the rest of it. In Persona 3, you and your fellow members of Seas are tasked with putting an end to the Dark Hour, a hidden 13th hour of the night where all manner of hell breaks loose. I mean, on one hand, people are sealed in coffins, water is replaced with blood, and shadows attack. On the other hand, Extra hour of sleep. Every full moon, a powerful shadow representing a major arcana appears as a boss fight. Hermit, Hanged Man, Emperor and Empress, and so on. And of course, the final boss, Nick's Avatar, represents the arcana of death. How many phases does it have? 15. Nyx has 15 phases. And that's as many as five threes. That's crazy. Now, for the most part, however, these phases are relatively easy. As long as you have a persona that resists the current element, you should be okay. Nyx does have an almighty AoE, but it doesn't do a lot of damage. With that said, there are still 13 of these phases, and they can take quite a while. Then you get to the final Arcana Death. Right off the bat, Nyx Avatar has 6,000 HP and resists every element except for Almighty. Oh, did I mention that Almighty skills are significantly more rare? They're also immune to knockdown, so that means no one mores or all-out attacks. Even if you have Satan to use Black Viper, you still have to deal with two incredibly annoying attacks, Moonless Gown and Night Queen. Moonless Gown causes Nyx to reflect all damage for three turns, essentially making the battle even longer. Night Queen inflicts heavy almighty damage to all your characters, along with random status ailments. And if the game really hates you, one of them can be charmed and then fully heal Nyx. But even after all of that, 
it's still not over. Nyx's avatar declares that the fall is inevitable and summons Nyx herself. In response, the combined hopes and dreams of your social links gives birth to a new arcana. You then enter a scripted solo fight against Nyx where your party members cheer you on from off the battlefield. Okay, seriously, this is starting to feel like Undertale. <sighs> Eventually, their encouragement gives you the power to finish off Nyx with Great Seal. And with all this in mind, Nyx's avatar can easily take well over an hour to beat. Even if you have Armageddon to insta-kill the regular forms, you still have to deal with all the unskippable cutscenes. And while this is an exploit, it's actually possible to completely bypass Nyx. If you start Tonica's social link on January 31st, the game will go straight to epilogue. So I'm gonna pay you $100 to f*** yeah. off. Alas, poor Kael'thas, a victim of circumstances who wanted to help his species overcome their crippling affliction, but stumbled down the path of darkness thanks to an insane amount of bad luck and really poor decisions, like falling in love with Lady Jaina who's a teenager while he's over 100, which makes us a really stupid plot element. Seriously, are like all the romantic partners of Jaina usually destined to become evil? She's like a gender bent Apollo. Anyway, he became the embittered Sun King, leader of the Blood Elves, and the final boss of the Tempest Keep the Eye Raid on World of Warcraft Burning Crusade. Now, Kael'thas himself is a tough boss to beat. He's able to smite your party with flame strikes and pyroblasts, take control of NPCs' minds, strike you down with his Infinity Blade, and even absorb damage with a Shock Barrier, and occasionally use both a Pyroblast and Shock Barrier simultaneously. What's that? Not tough enough? How about the fact that this battle is in five phases, and you don't even get to fight him properly until phase four? Phase 1, he summons his four advisors and you have to take them out one at a time, one of which constantly switches targets every 9 seconds, and another that requires a warlock tank. Phase 2 is a timed match against an assortment of weapons Kael'thas summons, and you only got 2 minutes to take them down, but once you do, you can equip them as your own weapons. Trust me, you're going to need them for what's coming up next. Phase 3, the advisors are revived, but this time you got to take on all four of them at the same time, and you've only got 3 minutes. Once those three minutes are up, ready or not, here comes Kael'thas himself for Phase 4. If slash when you get his health down 50%, he trades in his Mind Control and Flame Strike for Arcane Nether Powers, and the power to control gravity. And boy, does it hit hard if you don't save yourself. Uh, at this point, you'll probably be feeling... I have fallen, and I choose not to get up. And honestly, no one would blame you because this whole raid is just pure chaos. You're really going to need to coordinate well with your party, especially during phases 1 and 3, and really strategize ahead of time. You've got to know where you can kite one of the advisors, which spells to dodge, and how you can avoid going splat when Kael'thas starts messing with gravity. Suffice to say, this is going to be a team effort with a lot of trial and error, so you may be at this for goodness knows how long. But it'll be worth it at the end when you finally power on through one of WoW's most brutal battles against one of its most tragic fallen heroes. It's great to be a king. I seem to have a knack for taking everything I want and giving nothing back. Now that he's back in the spotlight again thanks to Smash, I think it's time to give the king his dues. King Crusher K. Rule is demented, hammy, and arguably the biggest baddie in all the Donkey Kong franchise, and the final boss of DK64. How fitting, DK64 is notoriously long, so why not wrap it up with a long final boss fight? And the final boss being dragged all the way to the ring. Fists of Five vs. Monkey Paws, with all five playable Kongs taking on the big bad Croc. Each Kong gets their own round against the big guy, each harnessing his or her own special ability. DK using his Barrel Blaster, Diddy flying with his jetpack, Lanky using his long arms and classic slapstick gags, Tiny using the old Tom and Jerry maneuver, and Chunky evening the playing field by growing to K. Rule's size. Survive five gruesome rounds of the ring and give K. Rule the big KO. Fall like a butter ball, sting like a flea. Already you know it's going to be a long fight with each Kong getting their own round, but you also got to make sure you can survive in the ring. Avoid being clobbered, flattened, or blown away by the king, being able to time your attacks, and knowing when to dodge. Tiny's is definitely one of the hardest because of her aptly named size and how long it takes to give K. Rule a hot foot, while Diddy's and Lanky's are the longest just because of all the steps and timing needed to get it right. You have to be in just the right position with Lanky or the banana peel trick isn't gonna work. Seriously, when did making this look like an idiot become such a chore? 
We bad guys never get a break. And the real kicker, if you lose one phase, you have to start the whole shebang all over again. Meaning, if you're not mentally prepared and don't learn from your mistakes, you're gonna be there for who knows how long. When it comes to platforms on the N64, DK64 broke the mold in terms of length. And this duel with the tyrannical lizard is guaranteed to test your patience and strategy. So, uh, <laughs> hope you don't have a busy weekend planned. It is I, the Seeker of Darkness. Yes, but not that fight. We're talking about the Ansem fight at the very end of the original Kingdom Hearts. You know, the one with unskippable cutscenes. No, I didn't make the unskippable cutscenes rule just to include Ansem. Shut up. What can I say about this man that I haven't already said a hundred times on this channel? He's hands down the longest boss in the franchise because of unskippable cutscenes. I know, I can play a drinking game every time someone says darkness during the Ansem fight. Darkness. 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 Yeah. King of Hearts, more like Kingdom Farts. <laughs> Let's instead focus on just how many stages this fight has. We have glamorous Beach Ansem, Beach Ansem's pool boy, Ansem's try for the football team as a linebacker, giant shirtless Ansem on a battleship, Ansem's battleship's artillery, Ansem's battleship's face, Ansem's battleship's heart, giant shirtless Ansem on a battleship too, electric boogaloo now in stores, with enough cutscenes to seek a battleship between every one of them. Many of us were kids when we first played Kingdom Hearts. Losing to a boss was frustrating enough on its own, and many of us were already traumatized by losing to Riku Ansem over and over, and having to watch that cutscene dozens of times. Having the same experience, but worse, if you lose to any of the stages of Ansem is something that will live on in infamy. Along that same vein, as kids, many of us only had limited time with our PS2s between school and homework and chores. So it was one shot at Ansem a day, two if you lost early on. It was not only a test of endurance for young gamers, but a test of patience of spending days or weeks grinding out attempts against Ansem. And when you finally beat him, few things taste as sweet. Really, there's no reason why this fight has so many forms and phases, but it does, and it's glorious. In an action JRPG where most fights are over in a matter of minutes, a boss fight that takes almost a full hour is absolutely deserving of a spot on this list. Fire Emblem games evolved to create good pacing with each coming title. While some are still longer than others due to technicalities, the steady flow of most of these games did help make the experiences gradually more accessible. Regardless, there's still people who enjoy games like Genealogy of the Holy War, despite how massive its maps are and how long it takes to complete each objective. Thank goodness the story is good. Usually, each chapter of the game has you fight bosses of different factions, not necessarily a single ongoing enemy force. It's not until the final boss that you actually tackle all of them as a single boss army. Meet Prince Julius, the son of Emperor Arvis, who inherits the major blood of the demon dragon Loptir. While he had a fairly standard childhood, his dark heritage was later awakened by Manfroy, who turned him into the cruel and calculating scion of darkness we came to know. Why Arvis didn't try to stop Manfroy, despite knowing about his plan years prior, is its own can of worms. But let's focus on the boss itself for now. As the Crown Prince of Grand Vale, Julius has the command of all its noble houses at his stead, as well as his own set of personalized platoons. These include the Paladins of Edda, the Axe Knights of Dazzle, the Bow Knights of Youngby, the Thunder Knights of Frigga, Ishtar's War Mages, Aryan's Draco Knights, Manfroy's Dark Mages, and the Twelve Dreadlords. <gasps> so as you can tell, he ain't playing around. You gotta cross the whole nation and capture every castle in your path until you reach Belhalla, the capital where Julius resides. The first couple acts are simple enough, you just gotta seize castles and deal with reinforcements. But once you get to the brainwashed Julia, that's where things get particularly stally. You gotta haul Salif across the map, kill Manfroy, seize Veltomer, and then go back to snap Julia out of her brainwashing, drag her to Veltomer, get the Book of Naga, and drag her all the way back to Belhalla to fight Julius. The Book of Naga is pretty much your main option to get that win against the otherwise overpowered Dark Prince. You can try to fight him with any other unit and their sacred weapons, 
but you gotta deal with them doing like one damage to him every hit. Assuming they even hit, since Julius's dodge rate makes me think that Piccolo trained him. Given the sheer size of Grand Vale and the amount of cliffs keeping you from taking a straight path, you're gonna be sitting here for a long time moving every single unit all across the map and fighting the multitudes of enemies being sent your way. Better have your dancers and rescue staff on standby because you will need them. Like most FE4 maps, this fight will take you hours to get through, clocking at an average of four to six hours, three hours with no resets, and a speedrun record of almost 40 minutes. That's longer than the average time it takes to beat most of the bosses on this list. Now the boss himself isn't that hard, assuming you have all your units trained to the max before coming in and don't let anyone important die. But yikes, does this show how trigger happy the old games get with their huge fucking maps. Made me grateful that modern Fire Emblem bosses are more forgiving for my patience. I wouldn't want to encounter another boss whose fight is as long as his hair. Kind of funny, we've had the end featured on two lists, and yet he wasn't at the end of any of them. I made a funny! <laughs> yes, once again, we tip our hats to one of the best bosses in the Metal Gear Solid franchise, The End. The living definition of the phrase, with age comes experience. He's got over a century of sniping experience and scary good stealth abilities, including a near-perfect camouflage suit and an eerie connection to nature itself. Oh, he's not in this game to kill Snake, he doesn't even use bullets. He shoots you with tranquilizers. No, he's in this little hide and seek game for one sole reason. Gentlemen, time for the hunt! It's the thrill of the hunt for him. It's his dying wish to go out in one last fight, win or lose. Though he's on borrowed time, he has enough patience and persistence to see it through. And whether you like it or not, you're gonna have to have the same amount of patience if you wanna survive his game, because thanks to his unique AI, he's one of the smartest bosses in any game. To survive, you're gonna have to out-hunt the hunter, and that's where we get into the long part of this fight. You're playing the role of both hunter and prey when you're fighting him, simultaneously tracking him down while covering your own hide. Use your thermal goggles when you need to, be careful about leaving footprints, look for sniping points, heck, let him shoot you with a dart at least once so you can follow the darts. All the while, you've gotta keep moving, keep your ears and eyes open, and don't sit in the scope for too long or the end will jump you. So yeah, it's gonna take a while to fight the end, probably an hour at best, but that's the true test of skill, having the patience, resourcefulness, and strategy to go toe to toe with the father of modern sniping. Of course, if you don't have the patience, you could also kill him earlier on in the game while he's sleeping, or you could always save your game and not play for a week or set your console's clock to a week later to let him age to death the minute you find him. And that's kind of a genius AI function, not gonna lie, but I don't know, it's really unsatisfying. So it really is a test of character where you have to decide, do you have the patience to give the hunter his dying wish, or do you cheat? You're free to play how you want to, but I'm just saying, he's probably the nicest boss in the whole game and isn't even out for blood. Let him at least have this. Hi Max, Mega Man X6. Hope you're good at swapping weapons on the spot, or you'll be pausing a lot against this stall happy boss. And you're dealing with them twice! Yami from Okami. Five stages, five forms, one last lengthy brawl against the literally well rounded evil ruler of darkness. Master Core from Smash 4. Huh, two rhymes. Anyways, it'll only come out when you turn up the intensity, but you've gotta be quick to defeat it, or it will one hit KO you. Giant Chicken, Family Guy the video game. The gag is long and tedious in the show, and now you have to live through it in the game. It's Yuzma, Yuzma from Final Fantasy XII. Let me put it to you this way. You see that health bar with an insane amount of segments? There are 50 of them. Each one represents a million HP. For reference, the maximum amount of damage you can do with most attacks in 12 is 9,999. Yuzma takes 30% less damage at half HP and below. Every element, except for darkness, is resisted. At minimum, this fight takes well over an hour. For me, it took four. And don't think that Yeezmat just sits there while you wail on it. It specializes in instant death attacks. Help you like having to constantly revive and rebuff your characters. 
It can also reflect on the party. Why is this important? Well, if you're not careful, you can cast Renew and accidentally fully heal Yeezbat. Oops! Even with a fully maxed up party and a highly optimized strategy, this fight can take well over two hours. No contest. From the moment we started on this list, there was no doubt that Yeezbat was gonna be number one. I'm Josh Scorcher and... Hello? Uh, small update. Um, I have some extra information I need to give you. As it turns out, Yeezman actually got nerfed in the International and Zodiac Age versions of Final Fantasy XII. And the global damage tap was actually increased to 99,999. And the new Turbo Mode feature allows you to speed up the game significantly. He's mad himself is now vulnerable to debuffs and is far easier to exploit his weakness to darkness. Combine all this and it's possible to win in well under an hour. Heck, some people have pulled it off in minutes. Well, at the very least, the vanilla version of the fight still qualifies for number one. I'm Josh Scorcher and... So, um, apparently there's someone worse than Yeezmat. And apparently this boss came out first. So strap in. Yeezmat wishes it could be even close to how overly long this boss is. This boss wipes its butt with Yeezmat. I am talking about absolute virtue from Final Fantasy XI. <laughs> how long does it take to beat it? While at its longest, Absolute Virtue took players around 18 hours. Screw it! Here's a list of things you could do instead! Watch the entirety of the Lord of the Rings Extended Edition. Read every diary of a wimpy kid book and watch all the movies. Get Excalibur 2 and Final Fantasy 9. Platinum Kingdom Hearts 2. Read the entirety of Problem Sleuth. Do a glitchous 100% speedrun of both Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. Watch an entire season of The Simpsons. Write a novel about the Titanic director's cut. The worst part is that Square Enix patched out methods players found to defeat Absolute Virtue, claiming it wasn't the correct way. Oh, picky, picky, picky. Just At one point, they showed how to beat it in a video. Said method was patched out. But I'm not done yet. Oh, and it gets better. We then had another boss introduced, Pandemonium Warden. Said boss took so long that some players allegedly got sick and vomited out of sheer exhaustion. It was only after this that Square Enix finally relented and nerfed both bosses. Nowadays, they're far more manageable to fight, but for being so astronomically long out of seemingly spite in the first place, Pandemonium Warden and Absolute Virtue have more than earned their place at number one. For, for real this time? Really? No one else? No. Okay. I'm Josh Scorcher and... Lord of the Rings. Cut. Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for Tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.